So good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to do that one more time. Good afternoon. There we go. So we're in radio, and we're really used to going on clocks, but that's the first time we've gone by church bells, and I really, really like it. So uh, thanks for joining us tonight. On behalf of KPCC, welcome to La Plaza. Uh, my name is John Cohn. I'm the managing producer of KPCC In Person, which is our events and engagement platform. We do a range of audience-type uh, activities and shows around Southern California, varying in scale, really large to really small, intimate. Um, and, and we're just thrilled to be able to get out into the community, out into the world that we cover. Uh, today's program is part of our Downstage series. Uh, and this is where we travel to performance venues, art galleries, and exhibits for conversations with artists and community members. Uh, and it's also a part of a series that we're doing covering Pacific Standard Time, LALA, which is why you're here today, uh, which is a collaborative effort led by the Getty to explore Latin American and Latino art in dialogue with Los Angeles. It's a lot of aligning missions and all that, right? Um, this initiative involves over 70 arts organizations. In fact, I think John earlier said 71 to be exact, um, but I'm going to defer to John on that. Um, our next one uh, in the PST series will be this coming Monday. We're going to be at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences in Beverly Hills for a screening of Zoot Suit, followed by a conversation with the frames John Horn, uh, Luis Valdez, Edward James Almos, and others. So uh, if you uh, still have uh, an open Monday evening, we encourage you to join us for that. Uh, you can RSVP at kpcc.org slash in person. Um, now on to the really fun housekeeping stuff because we're a radio station. Um, we are audio and video recording today. Um, so you're free to use your phones, engage social media, do all that. We just ask that you put stuff on silent. Um, we're on social. We're going to be using the hashtag downstage. Um, these things are video cameras, these little R2-D2 things. So we do ask that you not cross in front of them during the program because it's going to be really hard to edit out. Um, otherwise, nothing will make sense at that point. Um, photos are OK, no flash, and no uh, audio or video recording. We got that covered. I do have to say the downstage event is supported in part by the California Arts Council. Information on them can be found at arts.ca.gov, and we thank them for their support. And honestly, a very special thank you to the entire staff here at La Plaza. We could not have done it without them, and we were humbled to be included in their event today. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to the host of Take Two and your host for the afternoon, A. Martinez. All right. Everybody hear me okay? Cool. All right. So we're here for Murales Rebeldes, uh, LA Chicana and Chicano murals under siege. Um, I host a show on 89.3 KPCC Monday through Fridays, uh, weekdays. Uh, so give it a listen when you can. Um, and I want to make sure that we get enough time for our conversation and maybe even some questions from you guys. So if you guys got some questions lined up a little later in the conversation, there's going to be people walking around with a mic. Who will be those people? Let me s just uh, identify right in the back. Right there. She's in the back right there. Uh, so w if you got questions, I'll open it up in a little bit for those questions, about 30 minutes or so. So let's uh, get to our panelists. First, uh, Aaron Curtis is the senior curator here at La Plaza de Cultura y Artes and co-author of the book Murales Rebeldes, L.A. Chicana, Chicano Murals Under Siege. Aaron, welcome. <laughs> Here's the book, by the way. If you haven't got it, you should get it, look, it, look at it, and really kind of study it a little bit. It's a great book. Um, Irena D. Cervantes is an artist and professor in the Department of Chicano, Chicano Studies at Cal State University, Northridge, my alma mater. Irena, welcome. <laughs> and David Botello and Wayne Healy, they founded the public art team, Team East Los Streetscapers, and their murals can be seen all throughout Southern California. David and Wayne. <laughs> that's Wayne, that's David. All right, Aaron, so let's start with you. Sure. Uh, murals, a very unique art form. But I think in Los Angeles, actually maybe anywhere in the world, people walk past murals all the time and mm -hmm. have no idea that maybe they're seeing some, <laughs> some real art. So ideally, how should people interact with murals? I would say from the perspective of a curator, um, ideally it would be great if people were knowledgeable about the murals that are in their communities, maybe just what they are, who made them. Uh, if you wanted to go a level deeper than that, maybe have a little bit of knowledge about what the symbols are in the murals or what the histories that these murals are telling uh, might be and how that relates to your community and neighborhood because it could only enrich your experience of living there. 
And if I was going to go even deeper than that, I would say it would be awesome if people were aware that these symbols and histories are often still relevant to issues in their community in the present day. But that's, that's kind of my ideal from my point of view. I'd also be curious to hear what the artists um, think about how people should interact with their work. What do you think? Well, I think that these, uh, these murals have a long history in Los Angeles. And I think Aaron's point that it would be great if people understood that history and the struggle that the artists have really you know, gone through in order to maintain that form of public art. It's very important, I think, if in school, we started educating children as to the value of murals and the importance of murals and the contribution. It would be really excellent because they would grow up understanding um, in the, the, the meaning and the purpose and, and the contribution that they really have made to the cultural and historical life of Los Angeles. Elena, have you ever gotten a sense that a lot of people maybe don't think murals are as valuable as art hanging in a museum? Yeah. Well, absolutely. Starting, unfortunately, with art school, you know, um, there's the notion of high art and low art, and, and murals for a long time, I think, also because they were murals at the very beginning that were an expression of communities of color. Many times they were you know, murals that were painted, certainly by artists that, that were learning and working on murals, but also artists that were really from the community. And so there wasn't a real sense of um, understanding of the value of those murals and how significant they really were. And so I have to say that in my own experience, I think, um, for example, I think Chicana and Chicano Studies departments have really been instrumental in keeping the interest in muralism alive. My students are always really interested. And um, definitely there's just been this notion again of high art and low art and, and what, is, you know, what is more important in terms of the cultural life here in Los Angeles. Wayne, what about you when it comes to this, as, as Irina said, uh, this high art versus low art thing. Have you ever felt your work maybe not taken seriously? I always thought that the murals were uh, for us only and uh, the language that we ha used, visual language, uh, would be something that was understood strictly of people that lived in the neighborhood. And I was surprised to see when the murals came out, and I must say that the murals were a direct product of the Chicano moratorium um, they were expressions of pride and uh, uh, positive images that <coughs> weren't given by the Hollywood or the regular press. Uh, I think of the cactus, as Mexicans sleeping under the cactus is a stereotype that the murals were intended to, uh, to break. And so, they didn't seem uh, like something that went in a museum. In fact, painting in the projects, uh, was they were calling it a museum without walls. David, when it comes to your work, too, as a muralist, have, have you ever gotten the sense that where you put it and who sees it makes it not as valuable to someone? Say, say something that's hanging somewhere in, in LACMA or the Broad or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, no. I always thought that our artwork was superior uh, in the way that we did it for the community, first of all, and we did it for the location, and we did it for history, so that we put a lot of effort into, into designing it and, and uh, telling a story. So, uh, like for instance, uh, when we got our job at the Shell Oil, they wanted uh, Aztec, Mayan art, and we go back and we say, well, that's been done. Uh, that's too limiting. Okay, well, what do we come up with? Uh, there's Roosevelt High School around the corner. It has to have some education. The, it's, people are filling up their, their cars with gasoline. Well, let's do petroleum products somehow. You know, let's put the, the use, the why the word person arrived there, you know, let's let him see that and identify with our mural. Let's get a history lesson here. When did Chicano and Chicano murals start showing up in, in LA? Well, there are certainly forerunners going back to the Mexican muralists who worked in California in the early 20th century, such as Siqueiros, 
um, Orozco, and more. Um, but the murals that we talk about in our exhibition, Morales Rebeldes, began appearing in California in connection with the Chicano movement of the late 60s and early 70s. Um, by the 1980s or so, Los Angeles had come to be known as uh, the mural capital of the world. That's something we talk about a lot mm -hmm. in the show. There were um, so many murals here in LA, thousands of them, and the majority had been painted by Chicano and Chicana artists. What happened? Why are we not the mural capital of the world anymore? Well, that's part of why we have this exhibition to sort of uh, talk about the different reasons that uh, Chicano murals have been threatened. Um, and uh, the reasons why. What we ended up arguing, kind of one of the main theses of the show, is that um, the things that make Chicano murals really um, important and really valuable, the fact that they speak truth to power, that they uh, talk about histories that weren't being talked about in other institutional spaces, um, and that uh, they forge new kinds of um, artistic methods, such as working um, w you know, collectively with community members to plan and paint, all of those things really threaten people in positions of power, and we've found that there are a variety of different ways that those people then react toward these murals um, in terms of censorship, in terms of whitewashing, in terms of murals being knocked down, and so forth. Irena, why do you have to be so threatening? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that I think it's really amazing that muralism has um, lasted this long in, in the sense that it's several generations of artists that have done murals now. And when you think about the fact that, as Wayne and David were saying, that um, you know the murals really came out of the movement. They were uh, they were an expression of not just pride but of resistance. Mm -hmm. And um, also, it's it's just incredible that a lot of those murals, you know, were really self-funded at the very beginning. I mean, there weren't really that many funds, you know, for for artists to do murals. So communities got together and they did murals. The artists work with community members to do the murals. In fact, I just wanted to acknowledge in the audience today, I think Joe Gonzalez is in the audience, and he was the director of, um, of Goa's Gallery. Where's and Joe? so. Where, raise your hand, Joe. Where are you, Joe? Yes. There he is, right there. And so there were, yeah. And so, you know, some of the early arts organizations in East Los Angeles, Mexicano Gallery, and later, you know, when muralism started becoming. Uh, in a sense, institutionalized, but there, you know, some of the early funding, for example, um, inner city murals, citywide murals, later Spark, you know, their funds were more forthcoming. But I think back to your question, you know, why is it so threatening? Because Chicano muralism, for the most part, really have been have been murals of resistance. They they have contested, you know, that history that's been unspoken, and it's been a way in which we can assert our, you know, it, we can assert our, our sense of who we are and our, you know, our right to, to you know, um, equality, essentially. Wouldn't it be, uh, so w when you put a mural, uh, when you decide when you're going to put a mural or where you're going to put a mural up, why wouldn't it be more effective somewhere where people don't know that history? Say, why not put a mural in the west side somewhere or maybe in Beverly Hills somewhere? I think Wait. We did exactly that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, David and I formed uh, East Los Streetscapers in 1975, and our first mural was in the Lincoln Heights corner of Daly and North Broadway. Uh, that was a trial mural, and that we had such a good experience that we said, let's, let's go for it. At that very year, talking about being in the right place at the right time, the uh, California Arts Council uh, decided to have a statewide mural program, and among the uh, candidates was the DMV in Culver City. So we said, uh, let's go for it. At the time, both of us had real jobs, and one of mine, my real job was working in aerospace at Hughes Aircraft. And I, we went to the DMV to check it out, and David said, look, it's black. It's the color of space. So that was perfect. Uh, and uh, from there, we, we painted... Uh, out of California, uh, even um, in Europe, and um, it's it, we've expanded beyond our, our neighborhood, but we still paint in our neighborhood. David, what about this idea of painting not in your neighborhood, putting a message somewhere where there's people that have no idea of this message and maybe they'll be informed? Well, <coughs> we did a piece in Bellingham, Washington, uh, 
And so when we went up there, uh, there was no Chicanos around. So we, we met some uh, Hispanic group which welcomed us and treated us to a, a night out. But the locals uh, were the Lummi Indian tribe. And so looking around, we, we were able to speak to some uh, native people and the first Americans. And so we, they said, well, we, yeah, there's no images of us here in Bellingham. And so we weren't gonna put our Chicano images up there, although there were some up there. We thought, well, no, no, we should put our, let's put the history of the native people and the, the white people that came. Mm -hmm. So it, it turned out to be very, very well loved by the, by the community in general. And Irene, is that ideal to put a mural in a place that reflects the people that live there? Is that the ideal effectiveness for a mural? Uh, I think that it's important that the mural definitely connect to the environment and to the, to the concerns of the community. And so most of the time, I think that that's what I think artists try to do is to connect with community and make sure that, that, that they are reflected. I think somebody earlier said that um, one of the primary um, one of the primary goals of muralism was really to reflect that history that had been unspoken, to show positive images and strong images of, of Chicanas, Chicanos, Latinas, Latinos that had never really been, we did not study, particularly my generation, I know you've probably heard this many times, but it's true. We never heard or saw ourselves reflected in, in the history books and certainly not in school. So, or TV, movies. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and if we were in the media, they were stereotypical. So that was that was the, that was the project, is to really to begin to, you know, to um, to reclaim our history and to express it in the best way that we could. Take me through Chicanos with murals, because that's a history that really, I mean, as it is, Chicanos and murals, people don't know too much about, but Chicanos making murals. Take me through a history of that. Well, I think it's really important. I mean, certainly there have always been Chicana artists, but of which is not to say that Chicana artists always had an opportunity to explore their art or to go to school or have access to school or to study. So the same thing I think happened in muralism. There were Chicana artists that were interested in doing murals from the beginning, but I have to say that some of the first muralists that I remember doing murals are um, certainly, one of them is here today, is, is Barbara Carrasco, my friend. and and Barbara. fellow artist. And Barbara's right in the front right this. there. And also, you know, very early on, I think probably the first uh, Chicana Latina muralists I heard about mm -hmm. were the wonderful collective of artists uh, in San Francisco, the Mujeres Muralistas, mm -hmm. certainly later, Judy Baca, Judith Hernandez, uh, Norma Montoya, and you know, many others. There are a lot of Chicana um, artists that have done murals, we just don't hear about them. And, and what I'm really happy about is there's a whole young generation. Also, excuse me, Ana Siqueiros is in the audience, mm -hmm. and she's also a muralist. And so, so you know, there's a whole younger generation of artists that are um, doing work. Um, Christy Sandoval in San Fernando Valley with the Hood Sisters, and you know, in other communities, Nona Yolabisi. Of course, the woman that um, collaborated with me on the mural that's here at the Plaza, Alma Lopez. So many Chicana artists. We just have not been really, you know, we have not really been documented. So I'm happy to say that with this exhibition, I hope that, you know, murals find more support on every level. All right, now let's get to the murals being under siege part of this, because it's this an important part of the discussion, because murals have been seen as a threat for a lot of people. Um, Wayne Healy, David Bote, I went out with you guys uh, in Boyle Heights uh, a few months ago um, to see one of their murals that, uh, over time had been taken apart. You can see pieces of it upstairs uh, in the exhibit. But let's take a brief pause while we listen to uh, David, Wayne, and uh, me going out to Boyle Heights. In the spring of 1980, four young Chicano artists met up at the corner of 4th and Soto in Boyle Heights. They called themselves the East Los Streetscapers. Wayne Healy, George Yepes, David Botello, and his brother Paul were painters. They stood there, looking at a 200-foot-long cinder block wall right at the edge of a Shell gas station, and they saw a canvas. Their finished work would tell the story of their community. They'd call it filling up on ancient energies. 
It's sort of an urban tapestry. On one side, traditional Mayan figures mix with a multi-ethnic set of modern characters, laughing, reading, cruising. Down the wall a a prehistoric jungle where dinosaurs turn into crude. The tire store sits here now. The mural and the story it told is gone. Most of the wall was torn down in 1988. However, if you know where to look, you can still catch a glimpse of what was. I'll be down. Look at that. We painted that 100 years ago. Or it was 150, I forget. That's one of the artists, Wayne Healy. I see a uh, man with a sombrero coming over here. He looks suspicious. I put my hands on my wallet if I was you. <laughs> And that's his colleague and longtime friend, David Botello. Hey, Martinez, nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. Wow, they opened it up. They opened it up. Yeah, take a look. <laughs> oh. David and Wayne are seeing the last remaining stretch of their mural for the first time in almost 30 years. It's like a, a little child, you know, just living in obscurity. Up until recently, it was blocked by a stack of tires. Their mural is not the only one of its kind to be taken down or covered up with little to no notice. But to understand why this mural is so important, we have to start at the beginning. All right, uh, that was a really great moment for me because uh, David and Wayne, I, the emotion in your faces when you saw that last little part, it, it had been covered up with tires and it had been something you guys hadn't seen in a long time. David, when you saw it, and you came up to us, Wayne was already there, but when you saw it and saw that little piece, what was, what was going on for you right there? To, to know, it, it was destroyed, I mean, it was taken apart. I mean, that's something that you knew already. Right, now, <clears throat> when uh, we were invited to go to the site, I thought, well, there's not anything to see there, because I, I knew it was covered in tires. And uh, I'm, I'm so glad the museum contacted the owner of those tires and they pulled them all out. And I was uh, very happy, very surprised that you were able to s actually touch the wall now and go all the way down to the end of it. It was wonderful. Wayne, what about you? Because you looked a little emotional. I went in there and I grabbed the wall and I said, baby, how you, <laughs> have they been treating you? I haven't seen you in so long. It's me, your papa. <laughs> Now, I made the uh, analogy that if you had a 12 kids and one of them was bulldozed to the ground, you, you'd still have a, a loss there. And uh, for me to discover that part of that mural was still there was uh, like coming back from, uh, from the dead. David, what happened that it was taken down to begin with? Well, a after eight years of being in, in the public view, uh, it was a great gas station, a lot of pumps, well used. I get this unexpected phone call that it, it's being destroyed. A teacher from Roosevelt told me, come on down <laughs> now with your camera. <clears throat> so I was able to document what was happening. You'll see it in the show. And uh, I said, you know what? <clears throat> I'm gonna take some of those pieces and I started taking them chunks to my car one at a time. I had my three-year-old son with me and I, he had to be right with me. And so it's like, just in case, and I took a picture of our trade, our copyright symbol, our address was well in view. I mean, cause, uh, in case something would happen, you know, I know, uh, we have evidence. <laughs> to be clear, you had no notice, right? No notice no that notice. your work was being destroyed. No, it was a complete surprise, and it was a shock. There was pounding, ba 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 ba. Oh my God. <laughs> Wayne, you guys pursued legal action, right, against Shell? Uh, yes, the, uh, David Boteo at the time was a member of the Mural Conservancy. And as he explained to me, he brought the topic up, and uh, they had a uh, pro bono lawyer there, Amy Neiman, and uh, she said uh, they can't do that. There's a new law been written to protect public art. And um, she said we should go after Shell Oil Company for that, which is what we did. 
And we went to a trial at the Superior Court, and uh, we lost the uh, judgment. And then the judge turns around and says, I would uh, challenge my judgment in uh, appeals court. And when, uh, which I thought was kind of odd. I, I see all these judge and lawyer programs and I don't see a judge doing that. But we took his advice and went to an appellate court. We won the appellate court and Shell Oil wasn't through. They decided to take it to the California Supreme Court and the California Supreme Court uh, refused to hear their case. Thus we won and now when I look at the photograph that David took of the pile of rubble, I think of that mural as a sacrificial goat. And uh, because of that destruction and the ruling on the law, today all of today's murals are covered by that law. So it was uh, not a death in vain for that mural. Aaron, you were going to say? Yeah, going back to our discussion earlier about high art versus low art, this court case is so significant because this was the first time that murals were uh, defined as fine art mm -hmm. under art preservation law in California. Before that, they were not actually accorded that status. Mm. Yeah. Right. Elena, you also had um, a piece of work that yeah. was not destroyed in that way, but it mm. was destroyed in a different way. Tell us about your right. work. Well. I did a mural in Orange County, Huntington Beach. Uh, it was a collaboration with another artist, Alma Lopez. And this mural was a mural uh, specifically to talk about the presence and the history of people of color in Orange County. I guess most of you know Orange County has a very long reputation for being conservative. And What was your work called, by the way? Pardon what me? What was your work called? The, the priest was uh, called La Historia de Adentro, La Historia de Afuera, the history from within, the history from without. So, but we kind of wanted to dispel that myth because although Orange County is, you know, from the outside, very, you know, very um, monocultural, monocultural, am I being uh, tactful? It's very white. <laughs> um, it's, you know, there have always been contributions of people of color and a presence of people of color in, in Orange County. So we did not only represent the history, um, but we represented the, the current we, we represented people that were living and con contributing currently, you know, to that history in Orange County. Anyway, we did something, and I, I think part of, you know, and I want to thank Wayne and David for, for that sacrifice because it benefited us, but we did something that I think, you know, I, pro I as, a, as an artist and muralist, would never do again. I signed a contract that the mural would last only a specific period of time. So we were contacted later you know after that contract expired but the fact is is that that mural for us was really a labor of love it was so we it, we we put so much time energy and research we documented for example the the mendez family felicitas and gonzalo mendez they were the first people that uh, in La California that were responsible for desegregating the schools, 1947. Other, you know, really important historical figures. And so, you know, when the director of, um, of the, the current director of the art center, and that's the irony, this was an art center where our mural was, was painted um, in the parking lot in the wall opposite the art center. But anyway, unfortunately, um, they were not interested in preserving that history. They really were just interested in, in you know, painting over it. Um, so I would say very different maybe from, from Wayne and, and, and David's mural. It was really, our mural was destroyed through indifference, through, through um, an, an insensitivity, you know, to that history of people of color. You knew, though, that it was temporary? Is that, is that, did you have an idea that it wasn't going to last we, indefinitely? We signed that contract, mm -hmm. and we hoped it would stay, you know? And, and by the way, one of the pretexts you know, to painting over the mural was essentially so another person would have another opportunity. It was whitewashed in 2008, and it's still whitewashed. The only thing that remains of that mural, because we had three-dimensional elements, tiles, very beautiful tiles representing the ocean, the, those are the only thing on the mural. Everything else of content, you know, of, of the history, of the reflection of that community of people of color is not there. 
So Aaron, going forward, how do murals exist? Because in, in a future where there's things that need to be built, things that need to be, I, I guess the word is everyone's gonna look for is progress. It's called progress, right? Mm -hmm. new, new structures, new, new art. How, how do murals, will, how do they stay alive in this future where we move very quickly? I think it's interesting that we ask this question about murals because um, it comes up in relation to historic buildings, for example, and very frequently there will be a move to save certain types of historic structures, um, and there's very little question asked about that. We recognize that as important, and we make, uh, and you know, there are organizations that are formed, there's lots of activism that happens, and then those buildings are saved. We don't see that as much with murals and specifically with Chicano murals, which was part of why we wanted to put this exhibition together to create some advocacy around this issues. This public art is just as much a part of this city's cultural heritage as a historic building. We want people to see that and feel really empowered and um, motivated to go out and help save these murals. Well, now I'm going to mention the G word, gentrification, yes. because that is a big part of, the, of murals' future. Mm -hmm. When murals get cleaned up, I guess that's the, the nice way to say it, is that a larger issue when it comes to people moving around in communities? Maybe someone that's moving in doesn't want to see the art that really uh, people in that neighborhood used to appreciate. It's absolutely an issue, and I think that we have to think about what is lost when a mural like this is lost. As we've been saying, a lot of these murals um, speak to histories that maybe aren't being told in other places. So if the demographics of a community shift and maybe the only uh, thing that's attesting to the past history of other communities in this same space is a mural, to me it would become even more important to save it as a result. You know, how do you balance murals with the needs of a community or the wishes and desires of a community when they shift? Well, <laughs> that's a good question. Well, first, in terms of gentrification, I think that the murals are even more, it's even more crucial in, in terms of their preservation because those murals are the memory. They're the memory of that community that, that was there and in, in many ways still exist and unfortunately are not leaving through natural, you know, a, a natural course of action, right? They're essentially being pushed out. So in terms of how do you reflect the community, I think the community that, the, the newer community that is moving in has to understand, you know, that history of that community and also honor the people that have been there for, for a long period of time. David, is there a way to be okay with a mural being taken down, destroyed, altered in some way if it benefits the community in a different way? Say, say you've painted a mural somewhere and they tell you, look, we've got a place, we need to build a homeless shelter here. I mean, would that be okay? Would you be still upset that your mural gets destroyed? How, how, do, you, how do you balance that? Well, we, <coughs> we have a couple examples of uh, a building having to be renovated, but we were fortunate enough that uh, because they had to put two doorways, emergency doorways in our mural, they came back to us and said, could you do this mural over again? 50% smaller, and we were able to fit it in between the doors. So uh, we lucked out like that, but, but in, to answer your question, uh, we have the right to speak up and, and give all the reasons why it should be there before it's taken down. We, they have 90 days to make a deal with the artist. Uh, it could be moved, possibly, it could be uh, documented uh, and then made it, uh, you know something out of it that would last all after it's gone. But but the property owner has the right to do whatever they want with their property. So it, you just have to be, you know, able to converse. Uh, we have a mural that uh, they want to knock windows and doors into it. It's a very popular mural in Boyle Heights. And we talked to the owner, we talked to uh, cultural affairs, and we're trying to do the limited amount of, of you know, damage to the mural. And then we said, well, we'll work with you. We'll, we'll go around that window, we'll redesign it, but you'll have to, you know, get a new contract or something, you know. So it sounds like there is a way to salvage murals if you've got people that are willing to work, Erin. 
Yeah, there are, are a few different methods that we're mm -hmm. aware of. Um, you can, I think David has talked to me before about the possibility of sawing off brick to, mm -hmm. you might be able to elaborate on that more than me, actually. Well, what helped our case <coughs> in the uh, appeals court, <coughs> the Nathan Dackheim uh, restorer has a method of taking a mural off the wall. <laughs> he did it with Ken Twitchell's mural, the marathoners that mm -hmm. was on the 405, and then they moved it over to the five. A and the other murals that were done uh, during the Olympics, he, they moved them. So there is a process that he developed. And, and I'm sure we didn't know about that at the time. And we thought, let's go with power concrete saws and you know, save portions of it, at least. You know. but, uh, and, and then coming back to Irena's piece, you know, there is a method of removing that buff coat. You know, Willie Heron, who was playing earlier right here, mm -hmm. he, uh, he's, he has a, a, a solution. Uh, put it on the mirror, water blast it, and the top coat comes off. So if there's support, we could have a Reina's mural available to us. Would the owner of the building still have to approve that? I mean, if you could take it off and remove it. So if the owner says, no, I don't want you to remove it. I don't want you to salvage it. Well, that's, where you, that's where you get other people backing you up, okay. and you get government officials backing you up, and, and you have to have support for that. Now, if you got questions, uh, Liz is right over there with a microphone, so uh, flag her down if you have a question to uh, ask one of our panelists. Uh, Aaron, all the issues that we've discussed were explored in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, how did the project, how did the book come about? This was a collaboration between La Plaza and the California Historical mm -hmm. Society. My co-curator, Jessica Howe, uh, conceived the idea. She was really interested in um, our proximity to the David Alfaro Siqueiros mural, America Tropical, mm -hmm. which was famously whitewashed um, in the 1930s. Um, mm -hmm. And in thinking about that case and its legacy, um, she began looking at cases of Chicano murals and the ways that they had been censored and whitewashed and threatened. Um, she got in touch with our other co-curator, who's in the audience, Gisela Latour, um, who came onto the project and really helped um, expand our thinking about um, the kind of imagery in murals and why they're painted. And then I joined the project shortly after that, and it's been a really interesting two-year ride ever since. Nice. We yeah. have a question right over here. Hello. My name is Ana Siqueiros, and um, I'm also related to David Alfaro Siqueiros. So I have um, a couple questions for all of you. Um, so what, um, for each of you, what deciphers what a mural is? You see a, 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 a very much a different aspect of what muralists are considered. I would like to hear it from you directly about what is a muralist? What defines a mural from decorative wall painting? So I think that's a very important question that is answered today to put a precedence on how it does define the, the history of murals itself, and that the education aspect um, coming from here now is um, going to also help explain for our youth what the importance of muralism is and how to define themselves, that they, can, they cannot define themselves as muralists if they don't really know what the depiction of muralism is. So what is a mural? Luckily, we have three muralists here. So, Irena, what's a mural? Well, thank you for that question, Anna. I think that, you know, that's really a difficult question because muralists de depend on their murals getting funded. And we're, t we're talking about censorship here and murals under siege, but there's another kind of censorship that happens, and that's self-censorship. Many times when you're putting your cartoon or your image up for, you know, for approval, you know that you should not go there, right? You should not go too far <laughs> in terms of any kind of issue that would be seen as controversial. So in that sense, it's unfortunate because a muralist ends up self-censoring. But um, I think that murals are, if, the way I see it is that a mural is an, is, uh, is an opportunity to, again, speak your truth, speak the truth of the community, talk about that history, connect to the experience of those people, and you're having a conversation with your community. And in that way, I think it becomes more meaningful because the community feels 
a, feels invested in that image and, you know, is part of it. Wayne, what is a mural to you? Well, for us, a mural uh, starts with dimension. It's, it's going to be bigger than a postage stamp. <laughs> Also, it has to be integrated into the architecture and the community. And those are two different uh, items. Um, we don't want it to look like we found a pretty picture in a magazine and cut it out and pasted it on the wall. It wants to engage the colors, the linear composition of the building that it's on. And then naturally, it has to integrate well with the community. Uh, People should look at that mural, see themselves, and like what they see. And finally, if somebody from Mars came and landed here and looked at the mural, they would understand it. David, what about you? What's a mural to you? Well, I agree with uh, other <laughs> two friends here. And uh, to just to add, uh, my inspiration was uh, the Mexican muralist, the masters. And I took the cue from what they were doing, and also the ones that were created during the 40s in, in the, the post offices and uh, WPA. the WPA uh, muralist. I, I'm a traditionalist, and I, I want to do something representative that people can read and understand. It's like a book to me, uh, more than decorative. Uh, the decorative has its place, uh, and but and uh, sometimes they pay more money for a decorative piece <laughs> with a big name than they do for a blood, sweat, and tears story that an artist uh, came up with for for the viewers. Got another question right here on the side. Of course, uh, thank you all for your work. It's appreciated. <laughs> Um, the Department of Cultural Affairs gives out funding and approves new murals. Do you feel that the newer murals are keeping with the diversity of the city of Los Angeles? That's a great question. Irena? Well, I know some of the younger muralists, and I have to say we're really lucky in Los Angeles because there are so many incredible muralists. Some of them are here today. And um, I think, I, I can't say that I, I am really... Um, aware of everybody that's participating in the program. I can't speak to that, but the muralists that I do know that have participated are certainly very, very dedicated and I think try to reflect, you know, try to reflect what is meaningful. Here, another question right here. How are you? I'm uh, Fidel from Silver Lake. And uh, one of the icons of the Hispanic community is the uh, Virgen de Guadalupe, which is the Virgin Mary, and I think it's one of the most painted uh, murals throughout the city in uh, our communities. So in Silver Lake, I've seen it in uh, different stores and different places. For you as a muralist, uh, what does it represent? I know it for me my, uh, what it represents, but for you, what is it? the meaning of it that it there's so many people uh, painted that figure. Who wants that one? David, go ahead. Okay, sure. Uh, <coughs> I, I was brought up in Catholic education and uh, I really respect the Vitan. Uh, but I, I think it's used to uh, gain, gain respect from uh, the community, especially young people. You know, it's like put up to get respect for that wall. And I, I kind of feel like it might be a, a little overused myself, that image. Uh, but it, it's a, a lovely story and it documents the way they, the Native American people were really brought into the church. You know, they they had their own gods, uh, moon goddesses. Uh, and so when they put the Virgen with the moon underneath her and her brown skin, it became a way of giving, uh, the way I believe it, this is a personal view, of giving women liberation because the Aztec men were in charge of everything. But they were able to see themselves in her and, and 
it, the religion flourished after she was uh, she appeared in the Americas. I don't know Elena? if you wanted that answer, but there <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, I think that um, what David touched on is really important. It, the fact that the Virgen of Guadalupe goes back beyond the Christian image of the Virgin Mary. She represents, I think, for brown people in the Americas, that feminine face of God that was here even in pre-colonial times, and that strength, you know, and the power of, of um, you know, of the mujer and, and her role in, in creating transformation. So the Virgen of Guadalupe has a long history and a history even before the Virgen of Guadalupe. So for Chicanas in particular, you look at that image and they've reinvented what she means. It's, she's not a passive virgin. She's a, an empowered goddess. Erin, you're gonna get the last word here. So with, I know, a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. With the exhibit, with the book, what's the one thing you hope people can walk away from? I think our main goal, it's, it's really twofold. One is to um, get conversations about all mm. of these issues going. All of the stories that we've tried to tell in the galleries and in the book have so many layers to them and go into so much depth. And we would like to just get people to dig into them and then begin discussing the issues that they raise. And more than that, uh, I really hope that people begin to see these murals as part of our shared cultural heritage as Angelinos and feel inspired to um, get to know the murals in their community communities and really um, begin to look out for them and protect them and keep uh, these kinds of stories from happening over and over again. Erin Curtis, Irena Cervantes, David Botello, and Wayne Healy, thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Thanks everyone for coming out. Have a great evening.